Critical Path Analysis Introduction. Now, critical path analysis is important. As you can see from the past exams, a fair chunk of the marks in exam two for the module networks and decision making is made up of critical path analysis. So you can see it is quite an important thing. Now in this video, I'm just gonna keep using this simple example. You can see it in the bottom here. Um, and we're gonna look at what is a critical path, how to find the critical path, what is float, what is crashing. And there's a lot of tricks in here. Crashing is notoriously difficult for some people. But if we keep looking at this simple example, you'll be able to get the concepts and then be able to adapt them to any question. They always seem to come up with new ways of being tricky, but if you understand the concepts, you'll cruise through. But if you're just going, oh, I haven't seen this question before, and then having an anxiety attack, it's not gonna go well for you. So this video is designed to get the concepts in your mind and give you confidence that any question can be attacked. So my first question is, how many paths are there on this simple example? Let's do one example, just going straight through the middle. A, D, F, that goes from start to finish, that's a path. Then we can start with a green one, go A, and this time we go C, E, F. And then we're gonna do a blue path, which goes B through the dummy, which we ignore, and then F. Now let's add up the totals for these, and that might help us uh, determine then what is the critical path. So we know there's three paths, the green, red, and blue. So which is critical? All right, now, if we, uh, an important point on this diagram is actually this node here, because you can see all three paths uh, come back into it. Now, if we were to follow just the green path, coming into this node, seven plus three plus five, it we would take us 15 hours, let's just say the units hours for this thing. If we follow the red path, it'd take us 17 hours to get there. And if we follow the blue path, only 14 hours to get to that node that I've highlighted. So you can't start activity F until E, D, and B have been completed. Well, which one's gonna take the longest to complete? Well, the A, D path is going to take you the longest time to complete. Then all, once all three of those are done, you can then do F and finish. So the critical path, and we can see that when we can also look at the total values, so if we add up the, the, the whole green path, it's seven plus three plus five plus six equals 21. The red path is uh, seven plus 10 plus six equals uh, 23. And the blue path is 14 plus the six, we can ignore the dummy, it's as a value of zero, and that equals 20. And our critical path is this red path. It takes 23 to get through it, and that's because you have to wait at that highlighted node for D to finish before you can start F. E is already done, B is already done, but you still got to wait around uh, a certain amount of time for D to be finished. Then, and only then, can you start F. Okay, I'm going to do some forward scanning first. This will help us uh, find a lot of information, including the critical path and floats. So forward scanning, you go forwards, you are adding your numbers, you are taking the maximum of those numbers if you have a choice, and this will give you the EST, otherwise known as the earliest start time. Cool. And then we're gonna do a thing called backward scanning, which is pretty much the opposite where we, we go backwards against the arrows, we subtract, we take the minimum, and we get the LST, which is the latest start time. All right, let's do this. Now, the first thing you have to do is for every node, you have to draw a box. So we've got the start node here, we do a box like that, then the next node uh, between A and C, and there's another node here between a, C and E. There's a node here, there's a node for the finish, and there's a node down the bottom. Now, at this point, some of you might be saying, why didn't I do two nodes at the start? Because I've got A and B. Um, almost every textbook tells you to do this, but uh, there is actually a flaw in that methodology, and I've specifically designed this question uh, to show that flaw. So there you go, I should be writing textbooks. 
All right, let's start at the start and we're doing our forward scanning. Um, I like to do it in green because it really helps with uh, the confusion that will come later with all the numbers everywhere. Uh, definitely time to get your colored pens out. Now, following along A, zero plus seven is seven. Seven plus three going up the top here is 10. 10 plus five. Now I've got two things coming into a node, so I'm gonna just put that as an option, 15. Now, if I go through the middle and go A to D, that's 7 plus 10 is 17. So I've got two options, but I've also got this one down the bottom, so I've got to do that as well. So if I follow along B, I get 14. 14, the dummy is 0, so it's 14 plus 0 is 14. And now I've got my three numbers, and remember I did all my adding. I've got to choose the maximum, so I've been adding, I've been going forwards and adding, finding the max. So if I look at this, uh, my biggest uh, number is 17, and that's the one I chose. Uh, 17 plus 6 is 23, and I'm done with my forward scanning. Just clean this up a bit. Now, I'm going to do my backward scanning. So I start with the same number. This has to be the same number. So in this box, it's uh, whatever number you had in the left-hand box, you're now going to have in the right-hand box. But do it in red. Going backwards against the arrow, that's what we're supposed to be doing, going backwards against the arrow, subtracting, and when we have an option, we find the minimum. All right, so 23 minus 6 is 17. Going up the top, 17 minus 5 is 12. Going back down again, 12 minus 3 is 9, but there's two things coming in here, so I'll just put a little 9 there. 17 minus 10 is 7. Two options, I choose the minimum, the minimum is 7. Continuing on, 7 minus 7 is 0. And going back, we go to this bottom path, backwards through the dummy through B. So 17 minus 0 is 17, and 17 minus 14 is 3. I've got a choice of 0 or 3, it's 0. And that makes sense. These numbers have to match as well. So the numbers at the start and finish must match, and the start, they're always both 0. So if you've done something wrong, you'll find it right there. All right. So that is our forward and backward scanning uh, done. Let me just fix that line I accidentally erased. Now, when you're uh, looking at this data, uh, you'll notice that not only are these the same, these are the same, these are the same, and these are the same, and they represent these nodes. And that tells us that that, that is the critical path because we've connected them all up. So our critical path is a d f and it has a total value of 23 but you'll also notice that the other two uh, nodes and i'll highlight them in a different color i'll do i'll do orange these two there's a difference between the earliest start time and the latest start time what do we mean by earliest start time with the green that means uh if this was hours i cannot start f uh, until I've got to 17 hours. And the latest I can start it is 17 hours. So that means it's critical. Like there's no difference between when I must start it and when I can start it. But if I look at C, uh, you can see that I could start it at 10, but I could delay it until 12. So I've got a difference in the earliest start time and the latest start time. And that also affects C. But I need to talk more a bit about float. Now, in the textbooks, I'll tell you that this boxes tell you about float. So they'll say uh, float equals the uh, LST minus EST. So on the critical path, float equals zero. And that's what we've got here. So when we looked at our critical path, let's just eliminate those two, we had to follow through here and every single node has uh, a float of zero. All good so far. But this is where the mistake comes in. All right. If you look, if they ask you a question you, and then you say, well, float is LST minus EST and the boxes apply at the beginning. So this box is for activity E. Then you look at that and you go, okay, activity 
E has a float of 2. Correct. Nothing wrong so far. But if we look at this box, because it's on the critical path, and it replies to C as well as D. If it's if you're looking at D, you go, cool, it's on the critical path, no float. But C, activity C then has a float of zero. That is not true. So activity C has a float of two. And the reason it has a float of two is because the float applies to the node here. And we can see the difference of two in a back pass uh, here. That's the nine and the three. So you can see, like, if I uh, followed the book's advice, uh, I wouldn't be saying that C has a float. And there have been past questions on past exam papers where they've asked about this, and you might make that mistake. So what do we mean by float? Now, look, we talked about the fact, and I'll do this highlight in different colors. So we've got a critical path through the middle here, but we can also take a little diversion uh, through in this green path like that. So at some point, we are splitting off uh, here and rejoining here the critical path. And that, little, that whole green loop has a total of eight. I'll do this in uh, purple writing. So this whole loop has a takes eight, three and the five. So you can start, if you start at seven, then you'll arrive with a difference of two. And you can see the difference of two because you've got the 15 and the 17. So that means you're going to finish C and E two hours before D. Or you might go, look, I'll start it two hours later and you'll be fine. So the total of that green loop, that little diversion, the total float on that is two. All right, so you could delay C by two or you could delay E by two or you could delay C by one and E by one and nothing would uh, change about the whole thing. So. Just be aware that, that that can happen, and you might be thinking, oh, if it says something like, which two activities have a float of two, you might be able to easily spot E, but not see that C also has that float of two. Similarly, I'm gonna do, uh, let's do it in orange. This loop down here, it takes 14 to get to that point. Now this gets a bit trickier because uh, you're not just comparing it to the critical path, you're also con comparing it to the green path. Now you can uh, change this by a total of three because that's the difference in the boxes. So although B takes 14, uh, you can see that difference with the zero and the three here or the 17 and the 14 here. There's a difference of three at the end of each that uh, end of that orange loop. There is a float of three. So you could start it three hours late and you wouldn't delay the project. Or, uh, and if you do start it at exactly the same time, uh, B, exactly the same time as you start A, then uh, you're going to be sitting there uh, waiting three hours for D to finish before you can start F. So that's what we mean by the float, is that some of these l side loops um, can be delayed without affecting the whole critical path. But I just want to emphasize that um, Though you would have found, the, uh, if you've done a second box here, you should technically be doing a second box uh, here to catch that uh, uh, float problem on C. And uh, the books don't explain that properly at all, that that is actually a possibility. Whereas you can see the float if you think more about the loops and you look at the, the little numbers like these differences, and then you can see the float better. So let's talk about delaying activities a bit. So if I look through here, uh, that's my critical path. And I did say there's a little side loop up here. It's another path um, that diverges away from the critical path. And what happens if I change a value on that path? Now I said that that whole green path has a float of two because 12 minus 10 is two. So we have a float of two. So the float equals two on that green path. 
So I could change the times. So I could change C to 5. So now 7 plus 5 gives me 12. 12 plus 5 gives me 17. So I've got two 17s. So now we've got two critical paths. So now, if you asked what is the critical path, the critical path equals a d f and a c e f all right so now any delay any further delay to c would actually mean that that would become the critical path so if i now change this so instead of being changing it to five it's hard to undelete these things sometimes if I change the delayed C by I uh, made it six, I've delayed it by three. That's more than my float of two. So I've gone uh, plus plus three, and I've only got a float of two. So you can see we're going to have some problems. So once I do that, uh, this becomes uh, thirteen. Thirteen plus five gives me eighteen, and now my new number here is 18 and then 18 plus 6 gives me 24 so you can see now that actually ADF isn't the critical path anymore ACEF is the critical path that's where you get the 24 from so you can change that loop up to the maximum of the float crashing now this is where uh, people normally do crash on the exams but we're just all we're trying to do is uh, reduce the critical path which means you're reducing the total time yes now we've got to make sure we get a bang for a buck we don't want to reduce things uh, completely all, every, all the time because sometimes that's going to cause some effects so let's have a look if I was to change F so any change here is good. So if you want to reduce it, that is any change uh, lower is good. It's going to reduce the whole project. Why? Because it's on all the paths. There's no way to get uh, to the finish without passing through F, no matter what path you take. Therefore, any change lower is good for F. No problems. Now, let's have a look at D. Now, Remember, this loop has a loop of 8, and we said it has a, a float of 2. So going this loop as opposed to the critical path through the middle here, uh, you can see that you've got 10 versus 8. So you can change D by a maximum of 2, by a max of 2. So we can crash by a max of 2 because that's the float, yeah? On that particular uh, route all right and so by the same logic if we uh, look at the bottom loop here and it had a float of three so the most we can change this one let's go back to red this one crash by max of three and I'll show you what that means because we can that will change all the numbers, right? Let's do purple. So if I change seven by and reduce it by three, I will get four. And so that means this is now a four, and four plus three is seven, and seven plus five is twelve, and then four plus ten is fourteen. And now you can see in the myriad of different writing, we've got twelve, fourteen, and fourteen. So now we can change this one to 14, and which means our total would change to 20. So that all changed the whole thing by three, got us down by three. But if I went too far with my crashing, so I've got to go through and delete all these little lines. All right, just bear with me. Ooh, a bit too much deletion there. Let's bring back the green, my lovely yellow. All right, so we said we can crash by a maximum of three. What happens if I crash by five? So this will become two. Uh, this will become uh, 
2, of course. 2 plus 3, 5. 5 plus 5 gives me 10. 2 plus 10 gives me 12. And you can see that that that's not useful because now this these two are below the 14. So I reduce them, but they're below now the critical path. And the new critical path is actually the orange path going through B. So you don't want to over crash. So you crash by the maximum amount of float on that part of the path so that you don't change what the critical path is. You might end up with multiple critical paths as we showed before, you, uh, but you, what you want to do is make sure that, you, that the, you don't stop the critical path being one of the critical paths. So hopefully now you understand what is the critical path, what is float, uh, what are some of the difficulties with that, what is crashing and how it works. And uh, now uh, you need to go to the next video and uh, see the exam questions.